Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. So I think it's hard for anybody not to notice that the most important thing for both parties in the United States is to send as much money as humanly possible to Ukraine. And I think many people are confused about why this seems to be the top priority of all American politicians, whether they be on the left or the right. And so Ben Swan is with me today. He is the creator of a new documentary about the Ukraine war and Vladimir Zelensky. And I wanted to talk to him about all of this background because I think it's fascinating. I think a lot of people don't understand what's actually happening in that country. Ben, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. So a lot of people, I think, look at this war and they're very confused because you know, I'm like a lot of, I think, classic American, especially conservatives on the right. We saw Russia and we said, man, that's USSR, right? That's the bad guys. I'm pr I'm pretty on board with these guys, you know, be being the people that we've, we've done battle with for a long time. It's not hard to understand why they might be the belligerents in some kind of conflict. But the longer we go into this, the more it seems like that moral black and white is very confusing. It seems like maybe the story we've been told is, is not as obvious. And that doesn't mean that Russia isn't doing something bad or that Vladimir Putin isn't a bad guy, but it seems like there are far more interests involved than just the ones that have been described to us by our leaders. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. And look, the, the reality is this, you are correct when you say, especially as Americans who have grown up kind of post Cold War, we still have that the, the the remnants of that, right? We still view the world through the lens of Rocky IV. We're the good guys, and then there's these bad guys who are almost, you know, unbeatable, it seems like, and yet, and yet we'll pull it off in the end. And so we have this 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 cosmic battle between Russia and the US, East, West. Uh, it's it's a very easy narrative to sell. And I'm with you, right? When the war starts, it's very easy to say, hey, it's very clear Russia's bad and Ukraine, they're smaller and they're little and they're being attacked. And so we've got to stand as we always say, right, with democracy. The problem is the longer you watch what's happening, the more you see that actually Ukraine's not a democracy and whatever they were before Zelensky took power, they've become less and less and less of a democracy uh, during that time. In fact, I would argue that everything we say that we're trying to prevent Vladimir Putin from doing to Ukraine is actually what Vladimir Zelensky is doing to Ukraine. He's the one who's oppressing Ukraine. He's the one who's getting rid of political parties. He's the one who's shutting down the church, arresting leaders of the church, banning media in that country, no freedom of speech, locking up journalists. What's happening there is, is absolutely wild. And the biggest problem with it is that our media here, politicians, and of course, Hollywood, are all on the same side. Now, listen, you and I are probably going to share at least in one view throughout this conversation today. Whenever you get politicians, you get big media, and you get Hollywood all on the same side, they're probably on the wrong side. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever I see every politician in the United States saying the same thing simultaneously, I really start to worry about what's going on. All right, well, I definitely want to dive into, especially, I think, the background of what is happening in Ukraine. I think most people don't understand the history and some of the circumstances on the ground that led to this war. And I think once you have that perspective, it really helps people grasp then what's happening now. But before we dive into that, guys, let me tell you really quickly about ISI. Universities today aren't just neglecting real education. They're actively undermining it. And we can't let them get away with it. America was made for an educated and engaged citizenry. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute is here to help. ISI offers programs and opportunities for conservative students across the country. ISI understands that conservatives and right-of-center students feel isolated on college campuses and that you're often fighting for your own reputation, dignity, and future. Through ISI, you can learn about what Russell Kirk called the permanent things, the philosophical and political teachings that shaped and made Western civilization great. ISI offers many opportunities to jumpstart your career. They have fellowships at some of the nation's top conservative publications like National Review, The American Conservative, and The College Thinker. If you're a graduate student, ISI offers funding opportunities to sponsor the next great generation of college professors. Through ISI, you can work with conservative thinkers who are making a difference. Thinkers like Chris Rufo, who currently has an ISI researcher helping him with his book. But perhaps most importantly, ISI offers college students a community of people that can help them grow. 
If you're a college student, ISI can help you start a student organization or a student newspaper or meet other like-minded students at their various conferences and events. ISI is here to educate the next generation of great Americans. To learn more, go to ISI.org. That's ISI.org. All right, Ben. So like I said, I want to go over a little bit of the history here. Uh, everyone remembers, I think, watching that Tucker Carlson interview where Vladimir Putin went on this, this long diatribe of kind of explaining the, the history of Russia. A lot of people fell asleep in the middle there. But I do think this is this is critical, at least to get a little bit of that story, because without that context, it's hard for people to grasp what's going on. Many people look at you know nations today and they think, OK, you draw a line on a map and the people inside the map are part of the nation. And that's just how nations work. And that's how they've always worked. But that's actually a relatively new thing for people. Mm -hmm. And so if you just understand the world this way, then you look at what happened between Ukraine and Russia and you say, oh, well, yeah, Russia just went in there and, and randomly invaded a sovereign country and there's just no context to it. But I think if we understand the history leading up to that, it, it makes a little more sense as why Russia would feel compelled to involve themselves in Ukrainian affairs. Could you give us a little bit of history of what the country looked like before Zelensky came to power? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love how you you know started here talking about the, the Putin thing, right? Because listen, it, very impressive. I was very impressed by the fact that he was able to rattle off the history that he was. At the same time, you know, again, if you're a Westerner, if you're here in the U.S., you're like, okay, yeah, right. right? The, the crazy thing is this. I didn't know until we started this project that 300 years ago, give or take, that the capital of Russia was Kiev, right? It wasn't even Moscow or St. Petersburg. It was Kiev. The reality is, is that, that this region of the world Ukraine, Russia, it's it's been one region for a long time. And then there's been autonomy and there's, you know, as, as, as has been explained, I think, in other interviews, there's been autonomy. There's been times when, you know, the term Ukraine, I guess, doesn't mean a country. It means people who live to the east or whatever, something like that. But here's the history that I think a lot of people don't know. And, and the reality is, is that under the Soviet Union, right, uh, you had the very blurred lines, not just between Russia and Ukraine, but Georgia and all these different satellite states, right, of the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union dissolved around 1990, 1991, we end up in this situation where all of a sudden you do draw lines on a map and say, okay, this is now a new country. Russia is now here. Ukraine is here. Georgia is here. You know, um, Azerbaijan is here. Armenia is here. And so you're drawing out all these different these different spots on the map. But the reality is, is that Ukraine itself is, is a fairly interesting story because Ukraine is really divided into two parts, Eastern Ukraine and Western Ukraine. And for Americans who don't understand that, I would say, think back to after World War II, when you had East Germany and West Germany, right? One was controlled by the West and one was controlled by the Soviet Union. Well, the difference with Ukraine is Western Ukraine are more Ukrainians, um, but Eastern Ukraine are mostly Russians, meaning Russian speaking people from birth, right? That's what they are, the language they're taught. Most people in Eastern Ukraine identify as Russians. They fly Russian flags. Um, one thing we did not know in, until we started this process is that Vladimir Zelensky himself is actually a Russian speaker from birth. He did not speak Ukrainian until he ran for president. He actually took a crash course and learned to speak Ukrainian. He actually was a, a Russian speaker. And so this is not a, a, an unusual thing. The near history tells us something pretty remarkable, which is that back in 2014 or so, Ukraine, as this autonomous country, which again is only about 30, 40 years old as a country, is, is in the midst of having a presidential election. And, you know, around 2014, there's a coup after a recent election. And a guy named Viktor Yanukovych becomes president of Ukraine. He had long been kind of vying for this position. The IMF comes in and says, hey, we want to make a bunch of loans to your country and make Ukraine rich. And then Russia comes in and says, wait, wait, before you start taking money from the IMF, before you start taking it from the U.S., take it from us instead. And Yanukovych preferred to take money from Putin. Well, when that happened, there was a coup. We all know about the coup, right? I, I, I hope people know. Maybe Americans don't know. I think a lot of people but, don't, actually. Yeah. Yeah, there was a huge coup in 2014. It was run by the same people who helped push the Iraq war. Victoria Nuland, who was the undersecretary of state at the time. Um, go, goes into the to Ukraine and they help to foment a coup. It's called a color revolution and the government is overthrown, right? And these radical groups take over and the US and the EU 
install a new president, uh, Petro Poroshenko, and they installed this guy. And the problem was that Yanukovych, who gets run out, right, is pushed out of the country, um, is no longer in power. And the U.S. says, oh, look, it's a, it's a fight for democracy. Well, listen, that's not democracy, right? The U.S. going in and overthrowing another country because we don't like who he's going to take money from, the president's going to take money from, is not democracy. But we run him out. Uh, he's out of power. And then Ukraine falls apart. It struggles for the next few years. But simultaneously, as it's struggling, there is also a civil war going on. Because in 2014, you might have heard, as a listener, you might have heard about a place called Crimea. It's a peninsula to the east of Ukraine, down around the Black Sea. This peninsula has a referendum in 2014. The people there vote, it's like 88, 89% of the people vote to leave Ukraine and to join Russia, right? Very controversial. Even today, we hear a lot of politicians say, back when Russia stole or annexed this part of Ukraine. Well, they didn't steal it. The people there voted. Why would they do that? Why would they want to be a part of Russia? Because they were 90% Russian speaking. They fly Russian flags and they identify as Russians. There's also a region to the east, which people have probably heard some of these terms. It's called the Donbass region, which is in the east of Ukraine, which borders Russia. The vast majority of those people speak Russian, identify as Russians. What Americans have not been told, even though this information has been out there, we have not been, it's not been readily told in our media, is that there has been a civil war going on in that region since 2014. For 10 years now, there's been a civil war in this region, and it's people who are identified as Russians, but they live in Ukraine, who say, we don't want to be a part of Ukraine. And so the Ukrainian military and militia groups have been shelling and bombing that region of Ukraine now for almost 10 years. And thousands of people have died in this civil war. So back in 2019, there's a presidential election that's that's um, gearing up and a candidate comes along who happens also be to be a TV star. We've heard that story before, right? A guy who was on TV and all of a sudden he's never been in office and runs for president and, and gets elected. Well, it happened in Ukraine. The guy's name was Vladimir Zelensky. He was on a TV show about a guy who was a teacher who accidentally, you know, is caught ranting about government corruption on video. And so he gets elected and becomes president of Ukraine. Well, this actually plays out in real life. In the show, the show is called The Servant of the People. The guy who was the star of the show, Vladimir Zelensky, two years after this show becomes a huge hit, files a political party and creates a political party named after the TV show, the Servant of the People Party. And then the Servant of the People Party candidate, Zelensky, runs for president. And guess what he runs on? He runs as a pro-peace candidate who guarantees he will end the civil war in the Donbass region and he'll have peace with Russia. And because of that, he receives this landslide victory and becomes president of the country. That's the kind of the short history of how we get to, to Zelensky in power. Yeah, it sounds like a Black Mirror episode where you have this hyper reality and they they plan out the you know the, his ascension to the presidency by having him play the president beforehand, so everyone's kind of prepared for that. But, but yeah, I think it's really important for people to understand that this war is not isolated; it's actually nested inside of several other conflicts. It's it's connected to these, and mm -hmm. it's a result of that. And, and I think without without that understanding, you don't you understand the impetus for for some of these moves. But I think it's also important for people to understand the tension here you know samuel huntington in clash of civilizations identified ukraine as a civilizational buffer a flashpoint that would that would create the cra clash between the west and the russian uh, empire or, or you know what what is now functionally the russian empire because of this the tensions you're describing now huntington got it wrong he thought that they would work this out without a war and obviously that that wasn't the case but these tensions are long-standing he was writing about them in 1992 and they weren't really resolved even up to this point and i think a lot of people will look at you know uh ukraine and say well why wouldn't they want to be part of the imf why wouldn't they want to be part of nato why is it a problem for russia for them to join these global organizations i don't understand why they can't make that decision and i think as people who you know basically live inside the global american empire it's hard for us to understand that these organizations are extensions of that and so mm -hmm. another empire another civilization in this class of civilizations not model would see the buffer states joining that as a serious threat to their sovereignty oh a hundred percent you know one thing that i thought was very interesting about the tucker carlson interview was the, when when vladimir putin talked about asking Bill Clinton if Russia could join NATO in the 1990s. I thought that was, of all the things he talked about historically, that was the most interesting thing to me. And the reason that's so interesting 
is because you have to understand, folks, that, that NATO as an organization, right, only exists for one purpose, to hold the Soviet Union in check. That was the entire creation of NATO. That was its objective from the be very beginning. NATO actually lost its purpose when the Soviet Union fell. When the Cold War came to an end, NATO's entire point of existence was no longer there, right? And so they tr they stumbled around in the dark for a while, trying to figure out what what are we going to do. And they created, you know, the the Atlantic Council, and they created these different groups that were supposed to be about, well, we're gonna we're gonna fight cyber terrorism, or we're gonna fight against uh, cyber wars, right? They they started trying to come up with some other mission, and then they eventually abandoned that to go back to we need to stop Russia, right? That's how they kind of refound their purpose. What's fascinating about NATO, though is that when NATO, oh, excuse me, when the Soviet Union collapsed um, and NATO no longer had a purpose, one of the, the promises that was made to Russia at the time for letting go of all these satellite states and all these territories was NATO will no longer move. The, the, the quote was, will not move one inch to the east from where it was at the time. Since then, NATO's more than tripled in size. Right, it keeps adding countries, and those countries it adds are to the east. It keeps adding countries closer and closer and closer to Russia. And the red line for Russia has long been that you cannot make Ukraine a part of NATO. Why? Because Ukraine borders NATO. I'll give you a, people a, a geographic example. Right? If if the Chinese said we're going to adopt satellite states that are going to join us in any kind of military operation to control and even to, to hold back the United States. And they were doing this all around the world, picking different countries. They're on the verge of doing it, by the way. But they're, they're, this is what they were doing. And then all of a sudden they said, we found a, a new country we want, we want to join our alliance to suppress the United States. It's Mexico. Do you think we'd be okay with that? We'd be okay with them saying, we're going to move missiles and missile defense systems, and we're going to move military weapons into Mexico in order to hold back the United States. It's not because we would ever attack the United States. We just want to make sure that the U.S. stays where it's supposed to be and doesn't bother anyone else in the world. Well, I, I don't think Americans would be okay with that. I think we'd have a huge problem with that, and I don't think we'd allow that to happen. And yet that's exactly what's been happening with Ukraine. Yeah, we don't even need a hypothetical for that. This is the entirety of the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? Yeah. Like this, this we almost came to the edge of a of a nuclear world nuclear war, war. For, for exactly this reason. And NATO is a strange organization, of course, because it's been admitting things like Turkey, which are already kind of at war with other pieces of NATO. It's a it's a very it's a very strange uh, alliance, which which you know, kind of brings a questions about uh, why it continues, and probably one of the reasons that Donald Trump became very unpopular with much of. Uh, kind mm -hmm. of the defense apparatus when he questioned if NATO was still necessary and, you know, why aren't these other countries paying their dues? Is, is this even something we need anymore? Those those are questions you're not really supposed to ask, I think, at this point. And I think that brings me to my next question. You know, I remember uh, leftists really liking the Soviet Union. They loved Russia, couldn't get enough of it. You know, at any every point, it was America that was the aggressor and, you know, ridiculous that, that uh, we would continue to treat the Soviet Union as this evil empire you know the, the very phrase from ronald reagan the evil empire was a was a terrible thing and today it seems like they're all super on board with this there's no problem i mean even places like the state department which is no bastion of right-wing thought mm -hmm. seems to be very motivated to eliminate russia so why were all these people who used to be very pro-russia or at least very tolerant of russia all of a sudden feel this drive to basically wipe it off the map or at the very least pin it into a corner? Well, so I, I guess where I would approach that is to say that I think there's a misnomer there about what forces are doing this. I don't think it's so much that it's the left that's doing it. I think it's that if you take the political factions that exist in America, right, from, from MAGA over to, you know, the far left progressives, there's a big space in the middle there of what I would say are establishment neocon, now neoliberals. Neocons have almost gone away. Mm -hmm. They almost don't exist anymore. What they've done is they've just shifted on that scale and they're now all neoliberals. And so the, so the same people that we might have thought, you know, years ago of being uh, a neocon, a, a couple of names that would come to mind, John Bolton, right? Is John Bolton really a neocon or is he now a neoliberal? And has he just slid on this scale because all of a sudden the same people who hated John Bolton uh, years ago now praise him? I mean, of all the places he would get praised, places like The View, 
right? When when Sonny Hostin and and Whoopi Goldberg are on the side of John Bolton, it makes you wonder: Is he influencing them, or is he actually just on the sliding scale? And so I think what's actually happened is that these neocons don't exist anymore because essentially what Trump did was he forced them out of the Republican Party. And, and by growing a new form of republicanism, which is what he's done, and bringing in MAGA, MAGA has pushed out neocons. There's no room for neocons in the Republican Party anymore. And so they've all kind of become neoliberals now. They call themselves Republicans, but they're not Republicans. Um, they're, they're, they're liberals and, and not in the traditional sense either, right? The true, true sense of a liberal is someone who believes in freedom of speech and allows people to, to live their lives in civil liberties. They don't believe in that either, right? They, they're, they're this different kind of form of neoliberalism um, that believes in the suppression of all thought, suppression of, of voices, and is in bed with deep state and, and the military industrial complex. And so what all these sides do is they all look for common enemies from which to benefit. And so the the the, uh, the deep state and especially the, the military contractors in America after the Middle East wars had basically run dry and the American public was sick of them, needed a new target and a new place to kind of go in and make more untold fortune. And so they've shifted their attention from the Middle East and from the war on terror, which quite frankly, most Americans are sick and tired of and exhausted from. Because they, they didn't, you know, they had a lot of luck in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and then they had some in Libya and then less in Syria, and it was falling apart. Couldn't get it anymore, right? Because Americans were like, I'm, I'm, we're done with this. We're done with the forever wars, and we're done with, with paying for wars across the Middle East and Africa. Well, now they created this new big bad, bad boogeyman, which is actually, as we started in the beginning here, the old bad boogeyman. It's Russia, and so now we're dumping billions upon hundreds of billions of dollars into a war effort that again is a new endless war what's what's the end game there is absolutely no end game here yeah i want to get deeper into kind of this unified interest that you're talking about that's across political barriers and seems to move in between these ideological poles but before we do that guys let me tell you about your absolute absolute moral duty to hire based people through new founding hey guys i need to talk to you about new founding look we all know that the job market is a disaster right now based people can't find good companies to work for and good companies can't find employees to get the work done and that's why you need access to the new founding network New Founding has created a network of high excellence professionals who are seeking to join grounded American businesses. They're individuals, often in elite organizations, who are ready for a team and mission that supports their values instead of working against them. Aligned companies are already using the network to hire high trust, exceptional individuals who match the culture and mission of their team. You can apply for access to the New Founding Talent Network at newfounding.com slash talent. You'll be connected with candidates who will build your business. That's newfounding.com slash talent. Go there now to find your next hire. All right, Ben. So when we look at the conflict, I think you're absolutely right that guys like Bill Crystal and, and, and these other people who are classically supposed to be neoconservatives, be part of that foreign policy establishment on the right, very quickly vacated that position and moved to the to the center left with no problem. The question I think a lot of people have on their minds is why is foreign war the centrist position in the United States, be it on the right or the left? Why is that? It seems like the one thing that most people don't want. And yet it's the one thing that, you know, you can just become an ideological chameleon, completely shift all of your, your priors as long as you continue to hold to this constant idea of invading different parts of the world whenever the last conflict runs out. Well, and it's, isn't it so interesting to see how we've moved, especially since now you're going back to the, the hippies and, and those liberals in the 1960s, right? 50s, 60s, 70s, you had a very different group of liberals who were anti-war everything, right? And then you had the, the more conservatives were, were pro-military and pro-war. Then all of a sudden we get to somewhere around 20 years ago, and now you're not allowed to be anti-war no matter what. Well, but how does that happen? Well, it happens when you force through your control of media, your control of news and journalism, so that no one's allowed to question anything. As an example... Who would you say is the last journalist 
um, who's really become famous for challenging war. Now, I, go ahead. Glenn Greenwald, maybe? Glenn Greenwald, okay, yeah. But I would argue that, that Greenwald followed somebody else named Julian Assange, True. who was the real journalist who challenged war and actually brought down, in many ways, the Iraq War and, and began the kind of descent of the Afghanistan war through what WikiLeaks published. Now, that's controversial because there are a lot of folks out there who would say, well, he's not a journalist. I believe he absolutely is a journalist. But I also believe that, that more importantly than being a journalist is that Assange was willing to challenge the powerful in a way that corporate media just won't. They won't do it. And so when corporate media becomes bought and paid for by the very people they should be challenging, there is no one to challenge it. And so how, how does it become the mainstream position to your question? How does it become the mainstream position to be for foreign interventions everywhere, uh, for endless wars everywhere? For Listen, I've seen articles in the last year that talk about the benefit of a small controlled nuclear war. It would be good for the climate. It could help with climate change. It's like, are, are these people serious? Who would write that? Who would first of all, what what's a small nuclear war? As if you can control that, as if you have the ability to determine the size of the nuclear weapons that are used and who gets involved. Nuclear war is the end of humanity. That's what it is. If if we have a, a you know mutual destruction um, is supposed to be the deterrent to nuclear war. So the idea that you can even play around with terminology like that, uh, who in the CIA is sitting there writing these articles? on behalf of the New York Times or on behalf of the Washington Post. So I think that's where, where we've seen um, something really incredible happen. I would argue that about 20 years ago, there was a, a process that began within corporate media, whether it be cable news, broadcast networks, newspapers, where the military and deep state, not actors, uh, you'll hear people talk about like, oh, the you know the CIA back in the 70s through Operation Mockingbird, they would plant people in newsrooms. Okay, I believe that's true. That's declassified documents that prove that that's true. They don't do that anymore. The person from the CIA shows up on CNN and they put a banner across that yeah. says Joe Schmo, CIA analyst, or <laughs> working for the CIA. And he sits and he tells you the CIA's position on this war or on this conflict. And, and we have become so used to this that Americans will sit and listen and be like, oh, yeah, good point, CIA guy, who, whose entire agency's business is to go around the world to sow discord and to overthrow governments. But we forget that. We act as if, and I think there's also, it sounds a little conspiratorial, but I think there's a, a um, purposeful um, effort that's been made in Hollywood to sanitize that idea and to convince Americans that this is just normal stuff. This is just what we do. And this is actually a patriotic act. What they don't ever talk about when you watch shows like Jack Ryan or you watch movies about this stuff is they never show you what blowback is, right? Where every time the CIA goes in and, and tries to overthrow a government or, or leads to a revolution someplace, the, the, the consequence of those decisions. You look at a place like Libya where we went and we overthrew Gaddafi for a whole gamut of reasons. And you say, oh, look, we made the world a better place. And yet today, today in Libya, you can buy human beings in open air slave markets. That is the new Libya that was created as the result of our great democratic interference in that country. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I'm not constitutionally against war. I, I think war is part of human nature and it's an unavoidable reality. Pretending that we can never be truly anti-war is kind of a foolish perspective. But I do think there's a consequence for operating a global empire for profit. And it's pretty clear that that's kind of what's been happening here at this point. You know, the yellow journalism getting us into the war is nothing new that the, the Hearsts are pretty good at that. But, the, you know, the, this is something that has become a machine that just seems unstoppable at this point. Now, one of the things I was trying to try to get into a little earlier was. Why Ukraine in particular? Because you know you said, oh well, these other wars you know wrap themselves up. You know, we we can't find a new reason to stay in Afghanistan or whatever, and so you know we needed another place to go ahead and fund you know uh, funnel military dollars. But is there more to that? Is there something particular about the culture or or you know the the way that Ukraine is structured, the the corruption there that allows uh, you know United States companies or officials to go ahead and profit uniquely from Ukraine? Well, th there is actually. Um, so there's a couple of things. Number one, Ukraine 
And again, anybody who, who says before this war, I couldn't have found Ukraine on a map. Well, that's probably true of most Americans. They didn't even know where it was. Um, and at the same time, they know almost nothing about it. And what most of them would have no idea about is that Ukraine itself was historically in the last 40 years and infamously, if not the most, one of the most corrupt countries on the planet. That's not my my view of it. That's the United Nations view of it. That's multiple reports that have come out that say, look at the level of corruption in this country. It's run by oligarchs. It was handed over and, and basically auctioned off to the highest bidder. Um, it is essentially run by gangsters. Now, more recently, we have within the United States a whole lot of political players who have managed to get themselves involved in Ukraine. And that's pretty well documented at this point. We know the Biden family is very entrenched in Ukraine. We know Hunter Biden and his role in Burisma, who was being paid almost a million dollars a year to sit on a board for an energy company and he knew nothing about energy. Um, a lot of people don't know, we go into this in the docuseries, Hunter Biden also um, invested heavily into a company called Metabiota that ran biolabs in Ukraine and got Pentagon funding to run biolabs in Ukraine. So it's not just one place or two places or three places where the Biden family has, has business interests in Ukraine. Also why it's so interesting to me that, you know, I, I feel like with Trump, one of the things that has happened with him is that Trump will stumble onto something. Not, not knowingly, I don't think he, 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 he knows some of this stuff. I think he just goes in, he has no idea how bad it is, and he, he kicks a hornet's nest, and then all of a sudden they're, they're all out in the air, and it's like, where did this thing come from? Remember Trump's famous phone call to the, to the, the president of Ukraine, and it was so controversial, and yeah. why was he calling him? He was trying to get dirt on the Bidens, and, and it, became, it became the subject of an impeachment hearing. Right. right. It becomes such a huge deal. And you say, how did this become this big deal? Well, when you start to dig into Ukraine, you find out Trump stumbled over this nest that was full of corruption. It was full of these these uh, backdoor deals and hundreds of millions of dollars swirling around. Also, that's that's the past. But once you get into the war, it's not just the military. And so one thing we show throughout this series, it's 12 parts long. Um, each part of this series is looking at a different area. But one thing you're going to find as you as you follow this with us is that Ukraine is being handed over, right? It's it's not just about the war. It's the rebuilding effort afterwards. It's the massive global funds that are being set up to administer hundreds of billions of dollars going back into Ukraine and the control of that. Before this war started, the country in the world that had the most IMF debt by far was Argentina. It's why Argentina has the president they have now. It's why Argentina is so famously um, destroyed as an economy and the people are in such bad financial shape because they are owned by the IMF. The natural resources of Argentina, the labor of the people, the taxation situation, it's horrific. It's all because the IMF owns them. Well, now, by a long margin, when this war comes to an end, it will be Ukraine, not not Argentina, that is owned by the IMF. And so most of the money that's going to Ukraine, when it was first going, we were being told, oh, look, there lo uh, there's money being given from all over the world and, and, and European countries that are helping, the U.S. is helping. But the, you know what we're now finding is that a lot of this money is no longer a gift. It's no longer aid. It's a loan. And so instead, it's all being restructured into loans that now the, the nation of Ukraine and the people of Ukraine will owe for generations, they will owe billions upon, possibly by the time this is all done, trillions of dollars that has to be repaid over lifetimes, not one generation, two generations, but multiple generations. And in, in, and I would say to that, this might sound controversial to you, but I would say that, in fact, if you really want to look at who's at war with Ukraine and who just conquered Ukraine, it's multinational corporations. It's not Russia. The real winner the real entity that has won a war without firing a bullet at the people of Ukraine are multinational corporations that now own that country and will own it into the foreseeable future. Yeah, this is really nothing new for people who are familiar with, uh, you know, uh, the reconstruction of the American South and westward expansion. This is how the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and the Rockefellers built their fortunes. Those fortunes didn't just materialize out of thin air. They were built on the backs of war reconstruction, expansion, you know, funded by the government. Uh, and I would agree that to some extent this is multinational corporations, but I would say there's actually a wider there's there's a wider uh 
conflict here. That there's a a bigger network at play. One of the reasons it's so important to fell, I think, Putin, who again, I'm I'm not a fan of. This is not me chilling for him. He's a terrible person, I'm sure. But one of the th reasons it's so important that this guy gets bounced out is that he presents a, a, a possibility for a multipolar world. There, these All of these organizations that you're talking about are designed to go ahead and knit our Western ruling managerial elite class into one unified structure that can profit from this kind of thing. They isolate a country like this. They milk it for all it's worth. They do, you know, they distribute the spoils and this keeps them in charge. And that's why they talk about how we have to fight for democracy because democracy is just a stand in word as it always is, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. for oligarchy. And what yeah. they're saying is that this, we need this, this country is part of the oligarchic network. So we need to make sure that it stays part of the oligarchic network. The actual, freedoms involved with religion or voting or something are immaterial because when people talk about democracy in the United States or in Ukraine, they're talking about maintaining the oligarchy and the network that, that runs across many Western nations. And so I was wondering if you could talk about some of the, the things that most people would probably associate classically with democracy that have been stripped out by uh you know by ukraine uh during this conflict yeah absolutely yeah and that's and that's uh, what a great summation that was um so a couple of things one is uh absolutely freedom of religion which i think might be the most surprising to most americans right because we hold in, in our country freedom of religion is such a high um priority in terms of determining whether or not a nation actually has freedom or not uh, what's happened in ukraine are dozens of priests have been arrested the uh, excuse me, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, almost called it Greek, Ukrainian Orthodox Church has been shut down effectively. Um, it's allowed to operate only so long as um, they don't say anything from, from the pulpit that is deemed to be sympathetic to Russia. Well, what does that include? And and the, the priests, including the head of the church, who we interviewed in this series, by the way, two days before he was arrested by Zelensky's um, forces, they're not allowed to to speak out in ways that are supposed to represent, you know, anything that supports Russia. Well, they don't support Russia. In fact, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church specifically broke away from uh, the Russian Orthodox Church two years before the war started. And the Ukrainian Orthodox Church actually uh, collectively condemned the war. And yet priests are going to jail. Um, political parties, you know, in the United States, obviously, we have two major parties. Most people look at that and say, that's a problem. I would be one of those people, um, but it, it's pretty common for us, right, to have two major parties, and then obviously we have some smaller parties that don't really have much of a much of a shot because of the way the system is set up. But in most places around the world, that's not the case. In par parliamentary systems, you have many, many different parties. Well, Ukraine was one of those countries, um, had at least twelve different parties operating in Ukraine. Well, one thing that has happened since the war is that Zelensky's come in and banned eleven opposition parties, banned them all. There's one party that has power, and that is the servant of the people party of which he is the head. Zelensky has canceled elections in the country, saying, unless the U.S. gives us more money, we're not even going to bother to hold elections. It's too risky. We're at war. Like, you're just going to remain in power like a dictator and say we're not going to have an election? Imagine this. Imagine, imagine a guy who ran as a peace candidate, was overwhelmingly elected because he said, I won't be at war, now is at war. And because elections are coming, knowing he'll get thrown out, says, well, we're not going to have an election because I, we can't risk it, right? And the only way we'll have an election is if the U.S. and Europe dump billions more dollars into our coffers before we hold the election. Um, what else? Uh, oh, media. Media is completely under the control of Zelensky's party. Opposition television stations have been shut down, and you're not allowed to broadcast in the country unless you're on an approved channel, approved by Zelensky's government, giving an approved message. And so we've, we've watched what's happened over there, as I said at the beginning here, happen in a way that we're being told constantly that we have to fund this war because if we don't, democracy will be destroyed. So then we fund the war so that democracy can be destroyed. There is no democracy left in the country, and it's being completely run by this little man in a green suit who who walks around dressed for battle constantly, and and is never he doesn't he's never fought anybody, right? He's not part of the war, and yet everywhere he goes, including like the Met Gala, he shows up on the in a spread uh, what's it called a, a photo shoot for Vogue magazine, and he's dressed as if he's on the front lines. Right. And, and then he's ringing the bell to the New York Stock Exchange. He's doing all these things. And it's all this this persona that's built around this guy 
who in fact is doing every single thing we're being warned that Putin wants to do. He's the one who's actually doing it. Yeah, it really is an insane amount of kayfabe. Of, but it, I guess, <laughs> but I have some some uh, uh, some questions from the people, Ben, if you have enough time to, to answer Absolutely. a few. Excellent. Well, before we do that, uh, I watched the first episode um, and it was great. And I know there's going to be, I think, 11 more you said coming out. So where can people find these as they start to come out? Absolutely. So if you go to truthinmedia.com, truthinmedia.com, um, you can sign up on the email list there and we'll send them to you. The next one is going to come out April 18th, Thursday, April 18th. So uh, I think we're live on this show, right? So if this is live, then it's tomorrow. It'll come out. Uh, will be the second episode. It's called The World's Biggest Celebrity. And it goes into how this guy has managed to become the world's biggest celebrity without having done anything other than lead a war that no one's really sure why, why he's fighting. But um there will be, as I said, very detailed episodes where the weapons are that the U.S. is buying, where are they headed, where are they showing up around the world, because they're not showing up in Ukraine, they're showing a lot of other places. We look at the church, we look at the persecution of the church, we look at the, the, the persecution of political opponents. So we're going into great detail um, on, on all these issues because, you know, one reason we want us to do it as a docuseries is it's easy for people to watch like a two-hour documentary and not retain a lot of it. And so we're trying to be very focused in this. Because we believe that at the end of the day, the, the American people need to know what's going on with this war. We're watching Congress right now is having a battle over whether or not to send more funding to Ukraine. We have a, a border in the United States that's porous. We know that. Millions upon millions of people are crossing that border. We can't control that, but we keep sending $60 billion at a time to Ukraine. And it's, it's just insane. So go to truthinmedia.com. And then on X, you can follow us at truth underscore in media we also post there yeah guys make sure to check this out it's really critical like you said you've got guys like mike johnson who are basically trying to betray the maga movement and the right just so they could go and go ahead and push more money through to ukraine and israel and all these foreign countries while people invade our borders it's just absolutely insane people need to be aware of basically the money being stolen and handed to evil people because it, it, this can't continue in the united states it's going to be the suicide of our nation all right, guys, let's go over to the questions of the people. Uh, Creeper Weirdo here says, I don't care if The Rock played a presidential candidate on TV. He'll never be president. Even the attempt uh, will be a zombie fresh prince. You know, I feel like uh, I don't the the idiocracy guy, the the Camacho macho, you know, guys spraying the the machine gun. I wish I wish Zelensky had gone all the way into it. I, you know, gotten more of that, you know, more, more of that portrayal, a uh, little more of that. He, character. Listen, he's pretty close. He's pretty close with the with the with the outfits that he wears and the beard and all the I guess the juice that he's shooting up into the system. Like he's if you look at Zelensky when the war started and in two years what he looks like now, like he's got he's got to have like trainers working with him. It's all like this costume, this picture surrounding surrounding him. One thing that I, I've learned that was fascinating in this process is Zelensky has an incredible team that was brought in originally from Hollywood to train people around him. To, to put him um, in these like 360 green screen situations so that they can make it appear as if he's anywhere in, like, in any battle to do his, his you know, video shots from. Like a drone strike was just here. And it's, it's totally crazy. But the craziest part of it is the fact that, that we're supposed to watch it with a straight face and nobody on this side who has any real authority in terms of, of media and, and, and power ever is allowed to question or is will has the guts to question it and say guys come on this isn't real like we're we're being we're watching a tv show called the servant of the people that's what's really happening i mean it's smart you know in the united states we have to listen to hillary clinton or joe biden pretend like they were under enemy fire but zelensky's got the footage that's that's a way better system that's uh, we our guys should learn something from from these yeah people. Right. vr uh, Dayla says, uh, Ukraine isn't a people or a country. It's a zone where criminal activity is the main economy. It's where the corrupt evil come from all over the world to launder the money activity, hence uh, Western support. Actually, I did want to ask you this because I do know people, you know, it's not like Ukraine Ukrainians are uniformly, you know, uh, Russian. You know, that's, that's no, not the not. case or, or have sympathies towards, uh, you know, so there are many Ukrainians who are, I think, rightly concerned about, uh, you know, the, the advance of it. What is the... 
situation could could ukraine you know find itself in a situation where it partitions and and the the cultural divide for so that there is a people created out of this like what does that look like well yeah I, listen so i guess one thing i never got to when we were talking earlier about the geographic split of it we talked a lot about the east but mm-hmm. western ukraine is a people who identify themselves as ukrainian they, a lot of them are are um, closer to being polish um, and there's a lot more polish background there historically um and so it, basically, where you have Kiev, there's a river that runs through the country, and east of that river, right, is is identifies more as Russian, and west identifies more as uh, Ukrainian. Here's the amazing thing, though, and to give you an idea, like of of how people identify. Over the course of this war, you've had about there were only about 30 million people in Ukraine. About half of the country has left. About 15 million people have left the country and, and fled the country, which is pretty staggering if you think about that. The majority of people, and you can look this up for yourself, the majority of the people who have left the country, where have they gone? Russia. The number one country that has received people who have left have gone to Russia. Second is, I believe, Poland, and then third is Germany, which are very close. So what you have is you you do have an east-west split that's happening in the country right now. People who identify as Russian went to Russia. People who identify more as Ukrainian are in Poland right now, which I know some people who are in Poland. They're not very happy with the fact that there are so many people there. And then uh, going off to, to Germany as well. And so ultimately, when this war comes to an end, at some point it will come to an end. What will it look like? Well, it's not going to look like Ukraine used to look. From the, the military experts that we talked to, and we talked to them in this um, docuseries, they, they say it on camera. When this thing is over, more than likely, um, eastern Ukraine, big chunks of it will belong to Russia. They will be annexed in and they'll belong to Russia. The people will go back into those those uh, regions and they'll live there again, but they'll live under Russia's protection. And then more of the western side of Ukraine will become, you know, essentially Ukrainian. But in, in terms of a map, whatever that map looks like today, that's not what it's going to look like when this thing comes to an end. Arthur T says the rationale for supporting Ukraine is constantly a moving target. One week it has to save democracy, then prevent a new Iron Curtain from calling uh, from falling over Europe. Next week, it will be stopping Russian colonization of Mars. Yeah, unfortunately, it does feel like there's always a new reason. Though, I, you know, it's funny. Uh, at this point, it, it, you, you know, we used to hear that this war was going to be over in 10 minutes. It was, you know, it was going to be done. You know, you just cut Russia off from the financial system and the whole thing collapses. Right. And now it's hard for anyone to even pretend at this point that that Ukraine's going to win this. It seems like even our elected officials who are trying to vote them more money have stopped pretending like that's actually going to stop what's happening there. It's just, well, if we could just bleed a few more Russians dry, if we we could just fight to the last Ukrainian, that's really the only rationale left. Right, which is so so barbaric, if you think about that, right? So our our goal is to save Ukraine by killing all the Ukrainians. Our goal is to say, the only way, we're going to stay until every one of you is dead. It's like, well, who's signing up for that? In fact, who's actually signing up for their, their, their military at all? Another story that's not told in this country is the fact that, first of all, when people fled the country, men were not allowed to leave. They were stopped at the border and told, nope, you're going back and you're fighting. They have young men as young as 15 years old being forced into military service and men as old as 60 years old being forced into military service. And into what service? They have no chance. They can't beat Russia. The the U.S. is sending them lots of weapons, but what are we sending them? We're sending them weapons they can't use. And in many cases, they'll, they'll get weapons, then Russia will come in, will bomb them, and then take the weapons. So they're losing the weapons that we're giving them and the weapons that we're paying for, paying for, are going to military contractors to build new ones for us. So what's simultaneously happening that never gets talked about is that the U.S. is depleting its own weapon stockpiles to give them away. And who ends up with what they're either destroyed or Russia is the one who's taking a lot of them um, in the field of battle. Now, one thing I do want to say, people have asked me, why is this war taking so long? Like if Russia is so powerful, why, why aren't they winning? And I've been told the reason for that is because um, Putin could go in and just carpet bomb everything if he wanted to. And he's choosing not to because when the war is over, he wants to send all those people from Ukraine who came over to send them back. And you can't send them back if you've destroyed all the homes, all the infrastructure, all the roads, everything. Imagine that, right? The U.S. doesn't fight wars like this. We go into a place, we bomb everything out, and then we send in contractors and we build everybody's stuff. He doesn't want to go back and rebuild Ukraine. So he's taking time to not just lay waste to it so that there's something for people to go back to. Yeah, it's the difference between... The ground, that's what I've heard. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's the difference between a, fighting a war over something you plan to rule as opposed to something you just plan to replace. Uh, Paladin uh, YYZ here says, 
All I want to know is, uh, was Zelensky fairly elected? Meaning, did the people actually vote him uh, as, as a legitimate candidate? That's a great question. So our understanding of what we have found is, yes, he, he was not an illegitimate candidate. But again, he was, he was a um, very contrived candidate, right? He, his, his campaign actually started two years before with this TV show. The, the main oligarch, Igor Kolomoisky, who owns the network that they showed on, the One Plus One network, was his major donor, was the one who helped fund his first party, that Servant of the People party, um, and is still one of his closest advisors. So the whole thing was very choreographed. Did the people fall for it? Absolutely they did. Now, here's a little fact that media won't tell you. Zelensky, before the war started, had been in office for two years right? He was elected in 2019. 2022 is when the war starts in around February, into February. By the end of 2021, his approval rating was around 23%. He was wildly unpopular in the country. So yes, was he elected? Yes. On, on two things. One, a peace candidate. And two, that he was going to stamp out corruption in the country. He did not stamp out corruption. He himself is incredibly corrupt, was taking lots of money by, according to the Panama Papers, was buying properties in London, buying properties all over the world. And so he was extremely unpopular. Again, he was polling around 23 percent. We think Biden's doing bad when he's in the 40th percentile or the 30s. Imagine a president being at 23 percent and then the war starts. So the polls don't matter anymore. What people think doesn't matter anymore. And as I mentioned earlier, elections don't even matter anymore. Right. Uh, Kruverudo says, but the freedoms, we need to spread the freedoms. And finally, uh, J.H. Snyder says, you're correct about the Hollywood being an arm of the propaganda machine. But 13 Hours does a good job removing the veneer around the U.S. foreign affairs. I haven't seen that movie. I know it's a movie, but I have not seen that one. But thank you for that recommendation, sir. We'll have to check into it. All right, guys, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. I want to thank Ben so much for coming on. Like I said, I watched that first episode, and I'm looking forward to watching the rest of them, especially the one on where the weapons are going. That one I think I will find very fascinating. Of course, guys, if it's your first time on this channel, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notifications. Click the bell so you can catch these streams when they go live. If you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts, you need to subscribe to the Aura McIntyre Show on your favorite podcast platform. And if you'd like to pre-order my book, guys, it comes out in three weeks. You can pre-order The Total State on Amazon. Do that now. Thanks for coming by. And as always, I'll talk to you guys next time.